Hello, very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shanti. Coming up on our program this week, Amnesty International says 400 people have been injured as security forces crack down on protests. France 24 speaks to a number of people wounded during those clashes, including a young man who's had surgery to rebuild his face. Tens of thousands imprisoned in Egypt on political charges since Abdel Fattah al-Sisi came into power in 2013. According to rights groups, hundreds of them have died while in detention. Also on this week's show, from slurs to threats of violence, we have a conversation with Hind al Ariani, a Yemeni woman's and LGBTQ rights defender who's constantly under fire for her work. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters. We start with Lebanon, which following months of anti-establishment protests has a government again. But the country continues to be riddled in a crisis as some of these protests have turned violent. Hundreds have reportedly been injured during what organizers called a week of anger. Here's a report from our correspondent on the ground, Leila Molana Allen. 56. That's how many stitches it took to reconstruct Jean-Georges Prince's lip and chin after he was shot in the face by a rubber bullet by riot police while protesting outside Lebanon's parliament on Saturday. I heard the first shot and I saw a guy fall to the floor next to me. And then I took my hand off my face and I realized that it was extremely bloody. A friend of mine was behind me. Uh, he looked at my face and he looked horrified. I'm a boxer. So I'm used to taking punches to the face. I never felt anything like that. When he got to hospital, he'd lost so much blood, there was no time to take him to the operating theater. The four and a half hour surgery needed to rebuild his face was performed on a gurney in the emergency room. There's an absurdity to the fact that, that you, you actually get that kind of reaction from an institution that's supposed to guarantee your safety. International guidelines say rubber bullets should only be shot at the lower body and never at close range. Jean-Georges says the policeman who shot him was only four or five metres away. Weapons experts recommend at least five times that distance. He wasn't the only one wounded. Dozens of protesters were hospitalised with injuries from rubber bullets and tear gas canisters over the weekend. Several lost an eye. This is a rubber bullet. The rubber casing is supposed to soften the blow, but shoot them at close range, and they can cause almost as much damage as a conventional bullet. Tear gas canisters are supposed to be fired from a launcher at an angle into the air, so the contents is dispersed into the air, but shoot them directly at a crowd, and the impact can do serious damage. It's the misuse of these two that human rights observers say caused so many injuries at the Beirut protests. Lebanon now has a new government. But the new interior minister, a former army general, has praised the efforts of the security forces. Their methods look unlikely to change soon. Their main weapon is fear. I think they want to scare us into leaving the streets. What happened to me happened on Saturday night. And on Sunday night, we had thousands of people who went back again. No matter how much they tried to scare us, we're not going to stop. Uh, I think that for our generation, this is the fight of our lives, you know. Protesters say they're prepared for this new normal and won't back down until their demands are met. Jean-Georges plans to be back on the streets again as soon as he's healed enough to shout Thawra, revolution, once again. In Egypt, at least five political prisoners have died in prison since the beginning of December due to ill treatment, according to rights groups. Over the past seven years, 900 have died while in detention. One prisoner, that's Ala Abdel Fattah, a figurehead of the 2011 revolution, is entering his sixth year behind bars, accused by the government of having links with a terrorist organization. His family's only hope is to improve the conditions of his detention. Ala Abdel Fattah is one of the icons of the 2011 Arab Spring. He comes from a family of human rights campaigners. On this day in Cairo, he was commemorating his father. Allah believes that the fight must continue, whatever the cost. The fear is there, but also um, uh, the, the defiance is, uh, is there. It's always important to continue to defend uh, rights. Allah made this speech last September, in what was his last public appearance. Three weeks later, the authorities took him back into prison. 
For his family, everything they've seen of him over the past few years can be reduced to just a few photos, because since the end of 2013, Allah has spent more than five years behind bars. And he's not the only one. Thousands of Egyptians have been arrested again since September, following demonstrations demanding the ousting of President Sisi, who's led the country with an iron fist since the overthrow of the government formed by the revolution. Now, repression is reaching all walks of life. They are targeting political figures, they are targeting academics, they are targeting uh, writers, they are targeting journalists and lawyers beyond any scope we've ever seen before. But they are also tar targeting people in the street. Um, and I think this is the main um, like, uh, intimidating tactic they are using right now. Allah receives just one hot meal per week, which his sister Mona and his mother make for him. Their lives revolve around their visits to the prison and their fight to keep him alive. The prisons are no longer uh, a place for rehabilitation. They are more of concentration camps where um, the, the prisoners are subjected to extremely harsh uh, and criminal conditions and abuses. Mona and her mother hope that Allah will hold out until the day they manage to secure his release. According to human rights associations, more than 60,000 people have been arrested since the current regime came into power in 2013. The government accuses the majority of those arrested of belonging to a terrorist organization. Now to a regional peace plan that's being unveiled this week. There's some mid opposition from the Palestinians and increasing doubt from a number of players from the international much, community. Donald Prime Trump Minister has called it a Netanyahu, big plan and it comes as both Benjamin Netanyahu and his political rival Benny Gantz visit Washington. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammad Shatir has called on the international community to boycott this plan. Now, amid escalating tensions between Tehran and Washington, it's student travelers who seem to be paying the price over the past months. Dozens are reported to have been interrogated or turned away from U.S. airports. Many of them had secured places at prestigious universities, and all of them had valid visas. Some of these students report having been subjected to hours of questioning and humiliated. A number of them say they were placed in holding cells, and most of them were questioned about their political beliefs and activity on social media. The US Customs and Border Protection Agency, meanwhile, has said that being issued a visa doesn't guarantee entry into the country. Now to a woman who's been advocating for peace and women's rights in Yemen, a country where simply speaking about politics is deemed dangerous. And it's because of her work that Hind al Ariani was forced to move from Turkey to Sweden in search of asylum. The award-winning Yemeni journalist is now being attacked for a piece that she published on homosexuality. Uh, Hind, thanks so much for being with us on Middle East Matters. Your piece has triggered an avalanche of criticism. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I will tell you the story from the beginning. Uh, I was reading this article about uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Finland. Uh, it was published by uh, Jaffer Tok program. And they were uh, saying that she was raised in a homosexual family. And I was reading the comments. Uh, the comments were like, how come she's not lesbian? How come she's a good woman? So I thought that maybe I should write an article uh, about these uh, misconceptions. Uh, and explain to people uh, what, what is it. And the title of my article was uh, Why are you scared of uh, homosexual people? So you were trying to educate, but of course there was a backlash and that's nothing new. Uh, homosexuality in the region often sparks really spirited debates. And one of the reasons for that is because we are still talking about uh, largely conservative societies. Some of these countries, homosexuality is still punishable by death. Yeah, of course, in Yemen, it's uh, horrible uh, for anyone to be from the LGBTQ uh, uh, community. Uh, they uh, they kill them, they torture them, and uh, unfortunately, people, um, they don't feel bad about that. They, I mean, they don't defend, nobody would defend them. They think that this is the right thing to do. And I'm coming from this society, and I totally understand why people are saying that. And I uh, published a video telling them, I understand why you are mad. Uh, because we were raised, um, I mean, in school, uh, they were telling us that um, uh, a whole village was punished by God because they were gays. Uh, people think that uh, if we accept uh, gays, then uh, everybody will be gay, uh, and then they will not have kids anymore. <laughs> so, um, 
so I was expecting this uh, from the beginning. I, I, when I said it, I was expecting this back. Hint, there are, of course, other issues that are very important to you. You've been very critical in the past of radical views regarding women in Yemen. You've slammed uh, conservative figures who've essentially justified the rape of children in the country. Has your work, do you think, your words actually made any difference up until this stage? When we, uh, when I put about uh, this, uh, uh, the girl that was uh, beaten by her father, we were able to treat her her daughter, her sister, who was also beaten by the same father. But in general, um, I'm focusing on giving awareness to people because uh, every day more and more people, they realize that how it is so um, unfair. The Yemeni law is unfair when it comes to women and children. Uh, so this is uh, the main goal, actually. I want to stay on that topic. A recent study has actually revealed an increase in violence against both women and children resulting from the conflict in Yemen. How can we explain this? Um, yes, that's true. Um, we noticed that every month there is uh, uh, like uh, one case of a girl who is, uh, usually there are girls more than boys, um, are being uh, like beaten by the father or killed or uh, a woman that is uh, killed by her uh, brother or father. Uh, so this is increasing. And also the extremist group, uh, the number of extremist groups are increasing, of course, after the war. And uh, so, so is the violence really directly linked with the rise in the extremist groups? Um, not just, it's because, you know, the whole uh, situation is uh, encouraging you to, to be violent. Uh, there is, um, you cannot, um, you, you don't have salary. Uh, the media is all the time telling you to go and kill someone that you should uh, go to the war or you can't afford uh, your living. So you become uh, violent. I'm not, um, I'm not giving excuses to these people, but... Uh, this is what's happening. And um, uh, I think uh, the only solution for this is for this war to stop. Only solution is for the war to stop. On that note, Hind al Ariania, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to speak to us about these very important topics on uh, Middle East matters. And uh, of course, thank you as always for watching this edition of the show. Do stay tuned to France 24.